Hi everyone, welcome to the third episode of the Startup Playbook Hustle, a new segment of the podcast where I interview some of the best up-and-coming startups and founders on their journey, lessons, and challenges to date. My guest for this episode is Tashi Dorji, the co-founder and chief space officer at Two Space, a startup that turns restaurants, bars, and hotels into co-working spaces during the day. Prior to starting Two Space, Toshi was the co-founder and director of Carbon Conservation, Australia's first emissions trading platform aimed at conserving 700,000 hectares of forest in Indonesia. From an idea discussed over drinks and dinner just over a year ago, Two Space this week announced its expansion into Hong Kong and a partnership with Qantas to turn lounges into co-working spaces. In this episode, we talk about building engaged communities, how to make the most of PR, and how to develop effective partnerships. Without further ado, here is my interview with Tashi Dorji. Hi Tashi, welcome to the Startup Playbook Hustle. Thanks so much for being on the show today. For those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and tell us about your startup? Sure. Um, so my name's Tashi, a bit about myself. Um, I'm half Tibetan, half Nepalese. Family grew up in the Great Eastern Circus, so I've got a lot of circus fun blood in me. But in was, the circus? In the circus, yeah. That's incredible. Um, grandma, grandpa. Um, they got married when they were 13, 15 and had their first kids because she was like the trapeze girl and he was the strong man. And she had her first kid when she was 13. And the way they found out is because she was trying to do a triple flip and then she fell and hurt her hip. And then she went to the doctors and they were like, you're actually pregnant. So I, I come from a background of circus hustling, if you <laughs> would. Um, but no, the reason why I brought that up is that I feel really lucky because I was first generation born here in Sydney. Um, and then um, had a great education, but always wanted to start my own thing straight out of uni. Um, so long story short, fast forwarding all the way now to, to the, the startup that I'm working on now. Um, I run and co-founded a startup called Two Space. Um, and what we do is we turn restaurants that are closed during the day into a network of co-working spaces. Um, yeah, and we did it because there's a double-sided marketplace. There's venues out there that don't get enough foot traffic or awareness. Um, and there's people out there who need affordable office space, especially with this huge explosion of everyone wanting to start an idea or the freelancer economy. Um, yeah, so that's how we came up with it. Very cool. So uh, going back, like we, we go back a, yeah. little, t- a little while. Um, Two Space isn't your first startup. No. Is it? So uh, again, for, for those people listening at home, do you want to kind of like briefly touch on some of the things that you've tried to start previously and what some of the lessons were from going through that process? Yeah, sure. The first startup I ever got involved in was a really interesting one. Um, It's called Carbon Conservation. Um, It's essentially rainforest protection through environmental finance or carbon trading. So what we did is we could measure how many carbon emissions prevent from being released into the atmosphere by not cutting down a certain amount of trees. And then we commercialize that quantity by turning them into carbon credits, which we then sell to companies trying to offset their emissions. Um, we were the first ones to do it in Australia, which helped us get a lot of press, bring on celebrities and get um, exposure like from Page of Time magazine. But then the global financial crisis hit around that time, so all the carbon markets kind of crashed. So we went from seeing 17 euros per credit to cents. Um, so we really had to pivot and diversify, although what we did have was this very strong brand with an environmentally friendly outlook. So when we did start diversifying our portfolio, we started looking into other environmental or sustainable um, products. And that varied from condoms to every time you would buy one or give one, like the Tom shoe model, we would give one away for free to, to a developing country, um, to uh, composting, so waste uh, fertilization through the oil palm industry. Uh, we even looked into, we had a startup which did the Google Glass project in Asia, so we were spearheading that on a B2B scale, so working with tourist companies, trying to educate particularly kids on melting polar ice caps because we were working with zoos and things like that. But then I came um, back to Sydney for family and, and the two-space concept kind of just came to life because we just saw a need and we accidentally came up with it together with my co-founder. Yeah. So how, how does, uh, does two-space accidentally come about? <laughs> well, it's funny. It's, um, we were at a restaurant. My co-founder, Rob Walker, so he's the CTO. He's the smart one. Um, and the restaurant was empty, but we were eating dinner and we were essentially having a business meeting. We were like, this is not a two-space business meeting. It was more of a catch-up because we did work together um, back when we were both working in Singapore at the time. 
um, years ago. So we had that relationship um, and we were just talking about stuff that we were working on. And then we realized we were sitting in an empty restaurant having this awesome meeting in this really creative space. Um, surely there's something to that. We can, you know, turn this into some sort of model. And then at the same time, because we worked from Singapore for a while, a few years together, um, there was a cafe called um, Two Face, which essentially was a cafe by day and a pizzeria by night. So the aunties and uncles would go there during the day and have their coffees, but at nighttime the kids would come out with the beers and the pizza. And the coolest concept ever, because they were the only ones to do it, and the food wasn't the best, but you would always be talking about it. So we saw all, all of this space not being used during the day in Sydney, because that's where we started, and the um, City of Sydney Take Action Plan around that time was like, access to workspace is the number one pillar of becoming an innovative city. And then there was also the lockout laws showing how a lot of restaurants were shutting down and a lot of areas didn't get the foot traffic they needed. Um, so that's when we just kind of put two and two together and we didn't know it was going to be a home run or anything by all means, but we wanted to give it a shot. Um, mm. And that's how we started, yeah. So, you know, I feel like there, there are a lot of conversations like that that take place like, mm. oh, what about if we did this? Mm. But they usually get left there mm. or they get a little bit, of, little bit of traction and you work on it for like a week or two and it's like, oh, actually, I've got better things mm. to do with my life. What, um, what was that kind of like early, uh, the first few weeks, months of... Uh, from that initial meeting mm. and that initial kind of ideation mm. to actually launching it and validating that, that this business really had legs? Yeah. Well, to be really honest and raw, from a personal perspective, I was like, this is a great idea. And then I expected to just sit on it for a while. But then Rob, who I respect with Mountains, my co-founder, um, the next day he messages me saying, no, this is the idea. We should really focus on this idea. And he never says that. So normally in our relationship, I come with like a bunch of ideas and he says all of them are bad except for one. So he said that and I was like, okay, shit, if Rob really wants to put all his time into this one, mm -hmm. then there's probably definitely something there. It's not just a cool idea. Um, and then it was very simple to put the MVP together. We needed a restaurant that closed during the day. Um, we needed Wi-Fi and then we needed a way to get it out there to see if there was even a market for it. So we validated all those things, kind of, like we posted something really, um, it was a Friday, so against all of the social media guidelines and stuff of when you should post and what time, I was like, you know what, screw it, Rob, I'm just gonna post this idea on the Sydney Startups Facebook group on a Friday at 5 p.m. And then I'm just gonna turn my phone off because I'm not even gonna track to see how many likes and stuff, I'm just gonna enjoy a beer. At the second venue we opened, just, just in a bit of foresight there. Um, and then it turned out getting like over 500 likes, like 100 shares and like 100 comments, which is really great for that group because it's very transient and quick. Mm. And the feedback was all positive and everyone was very supportive. And because that group has a diverse community, there were a few journalists in that group, including a journalist for the Sydney Morning Herald, which was a good mainstream media for us very early on, and a few journalists from some of the startup um, publications. So that helped us get a bit of awareness, but then we didn't even have a location by then. We just put the idea out, so we had to hustle to find the first location. And that meant me, Rob, putting in some script into Google Maps to shoot out a list of all the restaurants that are closed from this hour to this hour within that area. And then we would pick 10 of them for me to go door to door knocking from 4.30 to 6, because the best time to catch the managers is right before they open, even though they got really annoyed. But they all said no, they were like, a lot of them were like piss off, you know, some of them were like, great idea, but we don't want to be the first ones. Others were like, you know, who's going to take care of the space? What about insurance? Um, so it was definitely tough to get off the ground. But we eventually found one, two crazy guys, um, Nathan Moses and Jules Marchetto, legends, who let us do it because they've had that restaurant for like years and years. They wanted to disrupt. They're interested in this. And even today, they engage the community so much because they work out of their own restaurant now during the day and they're working on side projects with these guys and getting advice, so it's amazing. Um, they gave us the space and then I went over to um, Optus Yes Lab. So Nick Bailey, the head of innovation there, I did a panel talk with him maybe a year ago and when Rob, my co-founder, reminded me, he was like, we need Wi-Fi, you know Nick, why don't you ask him? I'm like, oh, duh, okay. So I went and asked him and he liked the idea so much that he was willing to pilot with us. So then we had the three things that we needed 
and then we launched and, and then from there it kind of slowly started taking legs yeah fantastic and you know obviously you've had a huge amount of press coverage and just yeah. like general attention around uh around two space mm. and the concept that you've got um one of the things that like one of the questions that i get asked by founders all the time is like how do we get press coverage and mm. is press actually effective in, in helping us mm. get additional revenue or things like that uh, from your perspective, um, you know, what are some of the strategies that you use? Uh, you mentioned that you know, Sydney startups helped to get that initial kind of thing in, in place, but what's helped you to stay relevant with the press yep. and how has that helped Two Space? Sure. Well, I'll start with saying that the Two Space concept is a lot easier to sell than probably 90% of the startups out there. Mm. Like, so I'm not sitting here taking credit for being the best person at PR ever uh, because we don't have someone doing our marketing or PR. It's, it's normally just me. Um, and the reason for that is it's not a unique um, product which is tech related or medicinally related or you know insurance related. It's restaurants which everyone eats at, it's office space which everyone goes to and it's combining them in this huge sharing economy style of boom. So even the people who aren't into startups are like, hey, that's a great idea, how come I didn't think of that? So that's why that story was very easy to pitch and sell. Um, and also once we got our first kind of pieces of press um, it was very easy to leverage those to get more. However, one thing that I've learned is that we got a lot of press too early. Um, so we weren't ready for it. And what I mean by that is we didn't have the appropriate tool set up to measure the traffic that would go to our website at the time. We didn't know how to capitalize on the leads that would have come through. Um, so when we had the Sydney Morning Herald come out, like it was like, yeah, we were on the Sydney Morning Herald. But all that meant to us at the time is that we got to put the Sydney Morning Herald on our website saying, as seen on. Whereas it would have been amazing if we could have directed them to somewhere where that we could have gathered details. Similarly, when we were in the Australian Financial Review, we always knew that wasn't really going to be a publication that would generate members for us, as in buying co-working subscriptions. Because the way it works is that it's almost like a gym membership. Month to month, you pay this fee of 199 a month, but you get unlimited access. But then there's also cheaper packages. Um, you know, so. Like looking into that kind of stuff, we knew that that wasn't our demographic of people, but those kind of publications like the AFR, that demographic is more for branding and for working with other properties or investors, that kind of thing. Whereas when you start getting your startup media and stuff, that might be hitting the target of people that might want to look at your product. Um, and then when we got on TV, like for example, Channel 7 Sunrise, that's when we got a ton of trialists booking because that was all your average Joes, the guys who even work from cafes, freelancers who are just watching it even while they're in a cafe, early stages who work from home watching Sunrise. And then we measured all of that because um, at that time, you know, a special link went up and Koshi was nice enough to talk about pricing and everything squeezed it in for me. And we had our booking system sorted by then. And that booking system took us like six months to make, but whatever. We always thought we'd have it ready from day one of launch, but six months later, it finally gets built. Um, so it's, it's, it's just one of those things where media is great, but if you don't take advantage of it, at the end of the day, it's just a little bit of, um, you know, bit of a branding exercise. Um, like, we, we will we'll be having press coming out within the next two weeks, um, which I don't expect us to get members, but it will help with us raising our round because mm. it's with particular partners that show that we will have a global kind of um, movement. Yeah. Fantastic. And so obviously, you know, for anyone that's uh, following your story or like looking in, mm. um, it all looks incredible. Mm. Uh, you know, the success that you guys have and like all the partnerships and the hotels and the parties and the events. Mm. Um, but every every business has its challenges. Oh, yeah. What's, what's been... Um, What's been some of the bigger challenges that you maybe didn't expect um, when you launched Two Space? Yeah, sure. So one challenge which um, I haven't really talked about, but it's a big, I wouldn't say it's a, it's an obstacle for us now while we're this small, but not as we scale, is that um, because it's a restaurant and it's a rev share and I'm not on the lease, we've opened a few venues which have been sold within the first couple of months of operation. So suddenly we put all this effort into a launch party, advertising, building a community slowly. And then suddenly the owner comes to me and says, hey, we're actually going to sell. And then the new owners will come in and say, hey, I don't actually like this two-space concept. We're going to open for lunch and see how it goes. So then suddenly I have to move the community of people and all that kind of PR and press was useless. Um, so that's been annoying with our model. However, 
the reason why it's annoying now is because it was it's small enough to make an impact. Whereas as we scale to hundreds and hundreds of locations, um, I feel like that will happen less and it'll be more manageable. Um, one thing that also was we found very challenging at the start was bringing venues on because there was this huge trust issue and branding issue. But now that that's sorted, we have you know so many venues hitting us up that we can't even service. And the, building the community is actually the very difficult part now, as any co-working space would know. Like, not all co-working spaces are sitting at full capacity. They're having to throw out ridiculous discounts to just get people in. But also the nature of co-working is very interesting because the reason why we don't have these six-month lockings is because a team you sign in tomorrow, even in the more established co-working spaces, could be a team of, like, 20 in three months. So they don't want to commit to a six-month uh, lease for a table of only six. So that's why we have this whole flexible month-to-month -month arrangement. Um, so for us, it, it's extremely difficult because now suddenly we're targeting a new demographic of entrepreneurs, the people who you hear about working from home or their garages, who eventually graduate to these co other co-working spaces. But we're starting to bring them all together into the two space locations. And it actually took us a while to figure that out because when we first opened, we thought we would be not necessarily competition, but we would be getting all of the startups at that level applying for us. Um, and we do, but in a very different way that we thought. It's not like they subscribe to us or WeWork or Tankstream or Fishburners. Because we're affordable, they grab both subscriptions. And then they can you know, have their 9 to 5 desk at Tankstream or, or Fishburners and then one day a week work from the beach in Manly or Coogee or Bondi or the rooftop in King's Cross kind of thing. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, how has the, maybe not because you don't necessarily have a product, but how has the thinking around the business evolved, if at all, from, from that initial conversation to what it's like now and what have been like the learnings and, and how do you sort of approach the learnings as well? Um, the biggest thing that we've learned is that community is everything with this idea. Before it was like, let's just open 50 locations and see how it goes. You know, let's sign on the coolest locations, don't consider if people live within the area are just sick locations and that people will come. That was not the case. We've closed a few locations even though they were beautiful because there just wasn't a demographic that lived close enough. When we actually look at the data over the last year, majority of the locations that perform extremely well, especially Manly, everyone lives within a 200 meter radius of that place. Wow. So they could be working from home, but why would they when they could just walk next door for a really affordable rate and be surrounded by 20 other people who are working on their own stuff at home anyway? Um, so we found that the community was the heart, like the thing that we should focus on. Um, and even now, like we just um, hit over one year old. Only recently have we brought on someone who's doing full-time community management, Bill Rutten, who, yeah. who I know you've met heaps, and he's kicking ass in Melbourne. Um, Bill's awesome. Yeah, he's crucial. We need, we need Bill like in Sydney too, because I could do everything I can to get these cool hotels, these cool venues, but um, at the end of the day, because it is a double-sided marketplace, even the hotels and the venues, if they're empty, they're going to start asking questions after like five, six months. Not even five, six months, after like two or three months. Um, and then in terms of retention, because retention is the biggest thing in anything to do with office space or co-working, you really need to foster that sense of community. So it's not just about working somewhere, it's the events, the meetups. Um, so that's a big part of our consideration when we do this raise, similar to the technology, so we can connect everyone. Because one of our unique value propositions, aside from the really cool spaces, is we can open hundreds of these around the world, um, opposed to you know tens or twenties for some of the larger brands. Sure. Uh, and so obviously, with with a new location, I, I guess depends on how far away it is and, and all of those things. But you almost have to build up a new community from scratch and then foster up that community engagement again. Mm. Have you, you know, is there a, a formula or a process that you've worked out that helps you develop that at a, at a quicker level, uh, mm -hmm. taking on the learnings of having done this so many times now? Yeah, absolutely. Like before, we would open one and cross our fingers and see what happens. Um, now there's simple things like um, if you're smart with your Facebook advertising almost to validate an area, so you could just do something cheeky saying, would you work from a restaurant co-working space here and just target that area, um, put a picture or teasers and explain the concept. 
And then if you get enough people cooking through and signing up, you've got your leads, which you can convert. And then if you can open a space with 10 people already working in there, then the experience for the new people who try it out will be great, mm. opposed to just opening a space and people walking in and it's empty. Um, then they're most likely not going to be the first two people to sign up because they want to be around other people kind of thing. Um, yeah, and, and then similarly, the venues that we work with, because we get so many, some are gorgeous, but you need this, you need natural lighting, you need fresh air, you need, to, you need power outlets, you need the right chairs, you need all these things that you take into consideration, so we can't activate everywhere. Um, and the community manager is actually really important. So if there's a great place, but we don't have a good community manager, it's almost pointless to open. Um, so we take all these things into consideration, but it's all about cross-pollination as well. So when we partner with a hotel or a restaurant, they blast out their database and their community as well. Because most of them tell us, oh, we already have 10 people working from laptops here every day. So I think they'd like to be a part of it now that they know it's turning into an official space and then they don't have to worry about other patrons coming in and they get all these added perks with two space. So, yeah. How do you, like, you know, just the, the listing off of things that you said that you look for in spaces... Um, not all of them would have been um, something that would be obvious to me, like having the right chairs, for example. Mm. Um, how do you find that information out about what is important to your mm. customers? Um, so it's all we're small enough to just ask, <laughs> just yeah. ask them. Like I work from all of my spaces, so I just ask them, I'm like, hey, how's it going? What do you think of these chairs? Are they good enough? Or are you uncomfortable? And they're like, no, that's fine. But then obviously everyone's different. Um, and then when we sign on venues, we also inspect them. But because we get so many ac applications, they have a survey they have to fill out everything from the furnishing to why they want to be a part of Two Space. Are they doing it for the revenue or the exposure or the foot traffic, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, we just ask our customers. Um, yeah. Very cool. And what's next for Two Space? So big things, like we're in Sydney, Melbourne now. We really want to smash out Australia. Like there's really interesting places like Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane that we can grow easily into, especially with the support of some of our partners. Um, however, Hong Kong, I'm flying up in two weeks to speak with one of our huge partners there and also our hotel partner to get the first few locations off the ground. But you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Everywhere we grow into, we're not doing alone. We, we've got someone backing us. And when I say backing, it's not necessarily an investor, even though we are looking for investment now. Um, it's, a, it's a partner. So for example, Tankstream Labs in Sydney is our co-working partner, and they have been amazing. Um, and we wouldn't be where we are without Brad, the CEO's support, um, because it's sometimes it's as simple as, Brad, I'm throwing this event for this new area. Could you please share it with the Tankstream community? Or vice versa. Or with Tankstream Labs, their members can use two space locations one day a week for free which is perfect for them because then they can kind of experience that but also have that tank stream venue. But then my members can go work at tank stream on a limited basis for free as well. So it's almost like cross-pollinating communities now. Mm. Um, so it's win-win for everyone. Yeah, yeah I, I guess one of the things that um, strikes me about uh, the, the time that I've known you is your ability to build uh, relationships, networks, and partnerships with people. And so obviously, uh, you know, as you mentioned, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult to do anything on your own. Mm. And you, you know, you're often reliant on having people that can open doors or just provide the right connection or the right advice or, or you know, or the right partnership opportunity to that allows uh, additional value to be given to your members and, and that sort of thing. Uh, how do you approach developing partnerships with, um, you know, a, a brand like the Avola Hotel, for example? Mm. Um, so. My rule of thumb is that when you walk into a room, even if you see someone that you want something from, you never ask them directly. I mean, at the end of the day, if you get along both as a person or if there's any synergies, it'll happen. Sometimes it might happen six months down the track. It doesn't have to happen today. Brad and I, we met at StartCon and we only started really working with each other months and months later. But we just knew that we really liked one another and we liked each other's um, concepts and, and, and values. Um, but in terms of like the larger brands like Avolo, at the end of the day, they always want something out of it too. Um, they're an amazing brand and they're trying to d distinguish themselves as a hotel that really wants to disrupt the hotel industry. So for them, it's not necessarily getting 20 people co-working out of their hotel lounge, which is beautiful um, every day. It's more being able to look at the big picture and work with a brand like Two Space to show the community, not just the startup community or the freelance community or the tech community, um, but also their hotel patrons 
that they're different and they're funky. Because even the value proposition for them, when they start having hotel guests check into a volo, now they can start telling them within their newsletters, hey, did you know there's a startup co-working space in our lounge? Um, work, why don't you co-work with the two space members while you're staying at a volo here? You never know, you might find someone really interesting that you might want to follow up on. Um, similarly, they can jump in on, on the events that we throw at the hotel or somewhere else. So it's, and again, it's their guests getting this add-on experience when someone flies into Sydney at Avolo because Avolo is a two-space co-working location. Um, part of it is they get educated about the events we throw in the city or, or even the events Tankstream throws in the city. So they land, they do their work, and if they're interested, they can kind of octopus into different, different areas. Yeah. Fantastic. And I mean, one of the things that really strikes me about what you just mentioned is, you know, really understanding what is, you know, A, being focused on the value that you're providing to people. Mm. So it's not so much about, oh, it would be great if I could partner with X because I get Y. Mm. Uh, but it's also understanding, you know, what is it that drives them and what is the sort of unique thing that yep. you can offer them that will, you know, give them enough value for them to want to partner with you. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's just partnerships come out of just connecting people. Like, um, I've had a bunch of really great opportunities and partnerships come about by accident. Well, accident's not the wrong word, but like almost good karma because I'd connect two brands and then because they were so grateful for the connection and they're kicking off, they're like, well, how can we help Two Space? And then suddenly something comes out of that. So it's almost like, um, you know, you never know really what's going to happen. Um, sometimes when you do enter or even a networking room, you don't have to speak to everyone in the room. You just need to be yourself, know what you represent, and then, you know, have good conversations with people and then good things will come. Absolutely. Um, on that note, Tashi, thanks for coming on and sharing your uh, experience and, and insights with, uh, with Two Space. Uh, so a big part of the hustle is trying to join the dots between people. Um, and so the final question for you is how can the listeners at home uh, help Two Space? What is it that you're looking for that we can help, with you, help you with? Oh, just talk about it. Spread the word. You know, just tell people about how we exist and it's really easy to check it out. Um, that's all I ask. I think at the end of the day, word of mouth marketing is the strongest channel there is. So if you guys like the concept and you like me, then give me a shout out. Fantastic. And what's, what's the best way for someone to uh, say hi, find out more information about you or um, Two Space? Sure. So... The website's twospace.com, so T-W-O-S-P-A-C-E.com. We recently bought that. That was expensive. <laughs> um, you can always directly email me, Tashi, T-A-S-H-I, at twospace.com, and I'll happily respond. Um, but, yeah, if you go on the website, um, there's a ton of information there, even applications for venues or members or hosts. So there's, there's quite a bit there, and you can see all the venues. So, yeah, take a look. Awesome. Tashi, once again, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thank you, man. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the third episode of the Startup Playbook Hustle. You can find the show notes of my interview with Tashi along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. As always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. Want to feature on the Startup Playbook Hustle? Shoot me an email at rohit at startupplaybook.co or fill out the form linked onto the show notes for this episode. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes Thank you for listening and I'll see you at episode 73 of the Startup Playbook podcast next week.